Nobody works in aged care because they want to do a bad job. They work because they're there for the residents and they're there to provide care. I think, though, part of the pressure that's on the aged care workforce is this whole concept of the rising acuity of residents as they move into aged care. They're being asked to do more and more with the same resources and often with the same rostering online, um, which makes it very, very difficult to provide that real high quality person-centred care and to make sure that they're recognising deteriorations and changes in the residents as, as they age and as their health journey continues. Silver Adventures is a content and technology company dedicated to improving the lives of older adults through immersive virtual reality experiences. And this podcast is our opportunity to hear from industry experts, thought leaders, and passionate individuals to share with you their knowledge, expertise, and experiences. Welcome to the Age Care Enrichment Podcast. Hey there, welcome to the show. I'm Ash Deneef, and today's episode is something of a companion piece to a conversation we released a few weeks ago. You may have heard our episode with Professor Joseph Ibrahim about a fortnight ago called The Legacy of the Royal Commission, in which Joe and I were chatting about the impact of the Royal Commission's final report and the government's policy response. Well, this episode continues that conversation from a different viewpoint. On the show today, I'm talking to Karen Dillon and Rich Ainley from PwC, who as well as advising many aged care providers on matters of structure and management, they guided the government in the creation of the so-called Five Pillars Plan. And this episode is really about deconstructing the effects that this plan will have on the industry from management, care workers, and care recipients and their families. It turns out it'll take some time for changes to set in, but in the meantime, Karen and Rich have some ideas that can help the industry get ready for that imminent change. If you've been listening to these episodes and wondering, hmm, how can I help them keep releasing? Well, the answer is pretty easy. Just jump onto your podcast listening app and leave us a review with all your lovely thoughts about the show. They go a long way to helping us find new listeners and opportunities. And lastly, before today's interview, we're fast approaching the end of year and I wanted to sow a little seed that we're doing something a little bit fun and different for our episodes in December, which I'll tell you about more next time. But for now, we hope you enjoy this chat with Karen Dillon and Rich Ainley from PwC. All right, well, Karen and Richard, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Ash. Thanks, Ash. Great to be with you. Yeah, great to have you guys here. And uh, maybe we can start. Karen, could you lead us off? Who are you? What do you do? What's your story? So I've been uh, with PwC now for uh, just over six months. I'm a director in the health and wellbeing team. Um, I work specifically in the aged care part of our business, really looking to support and uh, build our firm as far as giving support to this sector during this time of disruption and transformation. Prior to joining PwC, I've actually spent most of my career working in health and aged care. So really working on the ground, boots on the ground, working with residents, patients and staff in uh, both the health and aged care sector. Fantastic. Richard, what's your story? So, Ash, I've been with PwC for a little longer. I actually joined the firm about uh, 18 months ago as the lead consulting partner for for ageing and reablement nationally. And um, that marks about the 25th year or, or so that I've been involved in the health and aged care industry. I've spent the last 10 years in consulting and before that another 10 or so in, in hospital health services and aged care management. And Mm -hmm. upon a time, I was actually a physiotherapist back in the day. Definitely not safe to practice clinically anymore, but I hope I still remember some of the things that I I learned as a clinician, caring for uh, patients and residents. Um, So actually, the the first job I ever had in the healthcare industry was an allied health assistant at Northwest Hospital in Parkville, Melbourne, which was uh, part of the the aged care services there. So uh, that was a little while ago now, of course. Great. And for our listeners who work within the aged care space, can we maybe give it an overview? What, what kind of work does PwC do in this space? How does that relate to people who are working within the industry? Feel free, either of you, to jump in here. Karen and I work with the consulting team at PwC. We also have a team in the assurance area and also in financial advisory. And we're involved in goodness, almost every aspect of, of the aged care industry and working with our with our clients. And so that can span for Karen and I areas such as um, Advising uh, Commonwealth on the design and implementation of new programs and reforms, some of those coming out of the Royal Commission and the Five Pillar Plan that we're going to talk about today. It can involve working directly with providers in areas like strategy, 
performance improvement and transformation and, and digital uh, of course right now focusing on on working with our clients to, to navigate what is a um a really important time of change um, both now and into the future for aging and aged care in australia and I think it's really important to note that ageing and reablement for our firm is a real priority. We see it as an area that really could benefit from our support and our assistance and, and that the sector is really calling out for. So um, we really plan to fo- continue to focus our efforts in that space. Fantastic. Now, uh, Richie, you, you uh, alluded there very nicely to a uh, a topic I really want to talk about today, which is after the Royal Commission's final report came out, this government proposed the Five Pillars Plan. Speaking broadly, I'd like to get into specifics a little bit later, but Karen, maybe you can lead off. What can people expect in terms of changes out of this Five Pillar Plan in terms of how they affect providers and the workforce? Well, I think the Aged Care Royal Commission was, of course, a bit of a watershed moment for the sector. And the response from the federal government has been significant with $17.6 billion worth of investment being planned over the next five years. The five pillar plan and everything that comes with it will be significant for the sector. And we're starting to see the impacts of that now. Although in the next few years is really when we're going to uh, see how much it really affects the sector. Um, It'll affect things across from funding to workforce requirements to infrastructure and the the models and delivery of care, the difference between home care and the residential aged care setting. So it is going to be quite a significant and potentially unsettling time Mm -hmm. for the sector. Um, We're yet to see the true ramifications of of the five pillar plan, but uh, it's definitely coming and uh, the sector is anxiously waiting for more information and more programs to roll out from the government. Mm. Well, I think what you've mentioned there as well, that change won't come immediately, but it'll, it'll trickle in and it'll probably trickle from the top down that organisational structure at the very top will, will notice the changes first and that'll filter to staff and then that will in turn filter to residents and care recipients. How will that affect people at the very top, board members and the such, Karen? Well, there, as part of the Five Pillar Plan, there is a, a, a major focus on governance within aged care. Uh, and that's actually one of the areas that uh, our assurance team particularly does a lot of work in. Um, we, what we've seen traditionally in the aged care sector is uh, particularly community-based boards where, you know, really well-meaning members of the community sit on the board to help govern aged care providers. The challenge with that is that they don't necessarily have the skills and knowledge and experience to ensure that um, the standards of governance that we would expect of a a provider such as an aged care provider are being met. Um, So there will be a huge program of work to seek to upskill the quality of boards governing aged care. And then that in turn will ensure ongoing accountability, both at the board level, the executive level and right through the organisation. What that in turn should impact is the overall quality of care. And the idea is ultimately we'll see less and less of these um, tragic and very sad stories emerge, some of which we've seen through the Aged Care Royal Commission. Mm. It sounds like through this upskilling and and perhaps um, reshaping of the boards that you might see people who would ordinarily be on the board be moved out and, and there might be a sort of different representation there. Do you think there's any risk of people who have maybe more of a vested stake in being part of the board being pushed out by this? I'm I'm not so sure that it's always um, an issue of being pushed out. I think it's a a question of of really of good governance of the organisations. As Karen said, there are increasing expectations that all organisations and their boards of governance meet the sort of standards that the community and funders expect of them. And it's a question of do they have the right balance and how are they performing? And in many cases, what was identified through the process of the Royal Commission was there were certain gaps, particularly in terms of what's called clinical governance. And that was really, I, I think, also a reflection of the way that the community is changing, the industry is changing. So aged care today, particularly residential aged care, is far more complex. The needs of residents are, are more clinically complex and requires a, you know, perhaps a different skill set to what was required, say, 10, 20 years ago in this industry. The average stay in residential aged care for most people is significantly shorter than it used to be. They're entering sicker, entering older, and that, that creates a different set of um, burdens on the organisation for having the right expertise, not just at, at, at the point of care. So it also that's also required at the board level to understand 
to monitor, to assure, and to make sure that there's a a process of both accountability and improvement across the organisation in those areas. Mm. Well, that's a really important point to, to point out there that aged care is not this fixed thing and, and the demographic that it serves is not a fixed thing either. It is shifting and the needs of people who are engaging aged care services are shifting too. One thing that might need to adapt to embrace these shifting needs is the, the model by which we're delivering care, whether that's the traditional residential model or retirement living or some combination of the two with home care. Either of you seeing any interesting or innovative models coming out currently that that might propose an alternative? Karen, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, So I think providers particularly are looking at lots of different options as far as how they deliver care. Because at the end of the day, it, it is about making sure they're meeting the needs of the demographic. And as the baby boomer generation moves through this particular cohort, their expectations of care are much, much higher. Um, so we are seeing some really innovative models of care, small home models where we have a, a reasonably small house or home like setting where there's a small number of residents mm-hmm. and dedicated staff um, living within that small home setting. Um, we're seeing a much higher quality of a traditional residential aged care setting where there's lots of ancillary services like a gymnasium and virtual reality theatre and all sorts of things for the residents of sense of lifestyle and things like that. I think the most interesting thing coming out of the baby boomer generation though is this real focus and preference to be cared for at home Mm -hmm. for as long as possible. And that's what's feeding into residents moving into aged care a lot older and a lot sicker and with a lot shorter length of stay because they'd much prefer to stay at home as long as they can. So I think there's lots of opportunity in that connection between home care and the rest of the health care sector, particularly you know, acute, subacute and allied health services, as well as opportunity to really leverage the emerging digital technologies that are coming out in this space for remote monitoring and, and care to really make sure that people who choose to age at home and require that additional support at home mm. can do so in a safe environment for as long as they can. Yeah, absolutely. Rich, anything to add there? Oh, look, I, I think Karen's framed that really well. Uh, the Perhaps the, the, the other couple of aspects to touch on there as well in terms of the different ways of providing care accommodation support uh, across the industry and across the community are, are also being driven by, I think, a recognition and an expectation that this is not just about providing care. It's also about providing well-being, fulfilment experiences that, enrich the lives of the people receiving the services and also their families in a way that perhaps previously was more viewed as a one-size-fits-all model. Certainly the way that the reforms are intended to progress is is intended to facilitate flexibility and choice and some of the ideas and innovations that Karen touched on there. And of course, it's worth noting, and as came out in the um, in the proceedings of the Royal Commission, there are a range of innovative models that are already in place. A lot of there are providers that are not waiting for reforms to roll through over a matter of years and are, and are pursuing some, you know, some really innovative ideas. And again, the sorts of things are, I think that are really exciting to see coming through. Absolutely. I guess I'm, I wanted to bring up this topic of new models and, and new directions because one thing that's included, or well, several things that are included in the Five Pillars Plan is a lot more uh, staffing hours. There are minimum care times, there are requirements of staff need to be here at this time. This is putting an increased burden on the system and on providers. Can they, in your opinion, working with providers, do you think that the models and the finance at the moment are sufficient to allow for this increase in workload? Karen, you know a whole lot more about this topic, so I'm going to hand over to you. (laughs) Uh, thanks, Rich. Um, yeah, it is absolutely near and dear to my heart as a, a HR professional by background. Um, I walked walked the floors with the aged care workforce and there are just some amazing people who work in aged care. And that was one of the things that made me particularly sad coming out of the Royal Commission is a lot of staff really didn't have a great experience of the public information that came out. And, you know, I, I certainly am aware of people I know who were um, the subject of all sorts of jibes and language towards them in public settings like supermarkets because they had their aged care uniform on. So um, I think it's really important to note that nobody works in aged care because they want to do a bad job. They work because they're there for the residents and they're there to provide care. 
I think, though, part of the pressure that's on the aged care workforce is this whole concept of the rising acuity of residents as they move into aged care. They're being asked to do more and more with the same resources and often with the same rostering online, um, which makes it very, very difficult to provide that real high quality person-centred care and to make sure that they're recognising deteriorations and changes in the residents as, as they age and as their health journey continues. I think the one of the challenges for the sector is the extreme workforce shortages that we're seeing across the country. Um, the aged care workforce is one of the largest service workforces across Australia, and they get a bit of a bad rap. It is really hard work. It's very physical work. The wages need a review, and I think we're all really happy to see that progressing through the Fair Work Commission um, through the work value case. And uh, hopefully that will have a, a significant um, effect on trying to drive people back into aged care. It, it is such a rewarding career, but it is a, a challenging environment to work in. So I think as providers continue to look at opportunities for flexibility and innovation and driving through the, the very fundamental concepts underlying the five pillar plan and the recommendations from the Royal Commission, we'll start making aged care a much more attractive career proposition so that we can start addressing some of those workforce shortages and, and really ensure that the, the quality of care that older Australians expect and should expect can be delivered by the workforce. This episode is sponsored by Ending Loneliness Together. I just felt a sadness inside. I've never spoken to anyone about feeling lonely. I've never spoken to my, my family. I think I always try to show I'm well, especially to the kids. They'd never imagine that I felt lonely. Over 5 million Australians are lonely. While we all feel lonely from time to time, longer periods of loneliness are damaging to our health and well-being. Ending Loneliness Together is a national Australian charity with the vision to halve chronic loneliness by 2030. We all have a role to play in ending loneliness. Consider making a donation, becoming a member, or sharing your story with others. Go to www.endingloneliness.com.au for more information. To stay with you here, Karen, looking at the five pillar plan, it, it seems like there is an increased workload, as we both said, but there doesn't seem to be a, a substantial um, program for increasing the, the workforce size and addressing that problem. I would be concerned that for listeners who are working on the floors, as, as you were saying before, they might just feel like this new plan means more work, more stress, tighter deadlines. Is that the reality going forward or is there something to be hopeful about? Well, I think there's lots of opportunity. I think I heard recently there's something like 14,000 students who have completed their certificate three in individual support who are trying to get a placement because they have to do a four week placement in an aged care facility before they can get the certificate. For me, that's, that's really hopeful as far as the continued push of workforce and people seeking to be part of the aged care workforce. I think there is also a lot of attraction for the aged care workforce. It's a really stable place to work. You know, out of the COVID pandemic, so many people lost their jobs or were out of work, whereas there was more demand than ever for, for, the, for aged care staff and certainly staff across the, uh, the health sector. I think if we can really lift the, the perception of aged care in the community, then it becomes, again, that much more attractive career pathway. And I know providers uh, generally are looking at ways that they can create career pathways for staff to make sure that they can progress their career and progress their skills through their employment in aged care. So there, there is a lot of hope for the sector. And again, you know, the the demographic of the aged care workforce, they are really special people and they are really caring people. So continuing to build how aged care is perceived in the workforce and, continue, and making sure that people understand how valuable that role is, I think will help drive people towards that as opposed to away from aged care. Rich, from, from your point of view, working with management and governments, what can boards and managers and sort of upper structures of an organisation do to support the workforce through this time of change? The providers that we speak to that are doing this well or managing this well are those that are focusing on just getting the simple things right about supporting their teams, uh, supporting managers to support their teams, investing where they can, albeit, you know, within limited resources at the moment because of the, all the other costs of delivering care and, and support 
accommodation in this environment, getting those little things right and attempting to sustain and build a positive and engaged workforce environment despite all the challenges that that, um, that sit outside the sector and individual providers are, are facing every day. The other challenge that providers, you know, management boards face at the moment is there is the promise of reform and investment in workforce and change and, and so forth as part of the plan. But really, we talked earlier about the lag time between the commitment to change and when the resident and the family experience it, the workforce is exactly the same. So there's the two key elements that I, I think are going to make the biggest difference for workforce locally are the new funding model that is, is currently being developed that will roll through that will ultimately impact how workforce is supported financially and the uh, the Fair Work Australia case that will determine what sorts of um, what sorts of wages uh, the industry can uh, can expect uh, into the future. Mm. And those two things, um, despite all the little things that that providers can do and the work that can be done locally, those two things are going to have a significant impact on on, on the aged care workforce going forward. Uh, of course, alongside some of the other reforms that have been announced in in the five pillar plan in terms of investing in workforce development, in career pathways, in in um, more attractive roles at various different levels in the industry. So there's a lot to come in this space, but equally, uh, you know, challenge providers and management teams to think about well, how can I support engage my my staff right now with with relatively limited resources and and massive pressures uh, both inside and outside of the industry. I think what providers can be doing right now in you know wait while they're waiting for the reforms to really take effect is to start looking at their overall employee uh, experience and the employee value proposition. What are the things that they can offer that are really a, a positive and a big benefit to the staff? Um, and you know, is it flexibility? Is it innovation? Are there some, you know, if you're not for profit, you can offer salary packaging. So there are some things that are already on the table that can really be focused on as far as looking for opportunities to improve and, you know, really refine the employee experience to make it uh, a more attractive proposition for the workforce. Mm. Yeah, I, it's nice to add some sort of tools there as well. I'm, I'm wondering throughout all the, the challenges and the, the noise, if you will, that Rich was outlining, it, would there be a, a like a through message that can kind of cut through all this to keep people focused on what they're doing and feeling good about their work, Karen? I think it's about the aged care workforce remembering how important their role is and what they're doing each and every day. They have an impact on the residents' quality of life and their experience as I said, every day. And I think that's one of the things that keeps people coming back to work in aged care. Um, the benefit of working in aged care is that you can develop a, a long-term relationship with residents and their families and really get to know them as people uh, and understand what makes them happy, what makes them sad and, and how you can really improve that overall experience. Mm. So I think that's really important to remember while, as you say, all the noise goes on around, around the aged care workforce. So with all these sort of spot fires and, and short-term problems to be focusing on, how can aged care providers also focus on the future at the same time? Yes, thanks, Ash. I, I think that's a question that, you know, certainly we've been wrestling with and our clients have been wrestling with since the almost the, the beginning of the, the Royal Commission, a recognition that, you know, this was going to be a time of and is now a time of significant change. Um, but, you know, providers need to be thinking about, all right, well, what... What does the future look like? It's not going to be the, the same industry in five to ten years as what we, we face today. The, the keys to success are going to be different. We, we have um, you know have, have spent some time talking to providers and, and thinking about okay, well, what are the different elements of that? And we've developed a, a methodology or an approach that picks up on some of the key areas, many of which we've touched on today. And you know that is having a you know a clear vision and a strategy and a, and a direction for the future, underpinning that with a sound financial and operational basis. Um, but beyond those kind of business sides being anchored around this idea of a holistic experience for the person and their family, that really goes beyond that one size fits all model of the past. And, and key to that, the, the fourth area that we've spent a little bit of time talking about today is, is how the, the workforce is engaged ultimately as the way in which um, you know that that experience is delivered. And then the, the the fifth of the five elements of the way that we think about transformation in aged care is the critical element of of infrastructure. And uh, uh, you know, again, just touching on that earlier point ar around aged care being about more than just care. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's about 
you know, every aspect of well-being and, and fulfilment for older Australians, the, the, uh, the place and the built form and the physical environment is key. Um, it's, it's also key to having a sustainable operation as well. And so getting that infrastructure component right, whether it's digital, whether it's around thinking about physical environment, facility design might be, all of those elements play into ultimately that overall experience that ultimately providers are going to need to be delivering to um, meet expectations and be competitive in, in what will be a much more competitive uh, aged care environment in Australia. Lots of different areas to focus on there in terms of preparing for the future. Rich and Karen, we've, we've covered a lot and I feel like we've looked at a couple of different issues and, and the future from a few different lenses here. It's just been great. For our audience who might want to learn a bit more about what you guys are doing or what we're talking about today, where can they go to find out more information? Well, the best place to, to start would be uh, PwC's website. We've got a whole lot of information around our work in aged care available there. Um, and of course, they could get in touch directly with either Rich or myself or, or one of the team. Well, Karen, Rich, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Ash. Thanks, Ash. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Aged Care Enrichment Podcast, brought to you by Silver Adventures. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. And if you're enjoying it, please leave us a review. We'd really appreciate it. If you're interested in finding out how immersive virtual reality experiences can enrich the lives of older adults, visit the Silver Adventures website today at www.silver, that's S-I-L-V-R, adventures.com.au. See you next week.